Hello and uh, welcome to uh, uh, SD HistCon Spring 2003. Uh, I'm here with uh, Brian Train, and we're going to be talking about uh, modern urban contact uh, combat. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I'm I'm very I'm very grateful to be uh, to be able to participate in um, in uh, this uh, sorry to be able to participate in this event the the SD Hiscon online it's um as someone who I, I live in Calgary so there's not a ton of uh, big uh, tournaments or conventions that I get to go to so I'm I'm really happy to be able to participate in an online thing like this Yep, I'm happy too, and um, I hope one day to make it down to the real life San Diego HISTCON. Uh, it's on or about Remembrance Day weekend, uh, so right now, so it kind of coincides with BOTOSCON, which is right. a, a convention I go to in, in Burnaby that's put on by Rob Bottos, uh, so I haven't really been able to make it down there. I have been to San Diego once though, and a uh, beautiful city, I'd love to come back. Well, I, I sort of have the feeling that I'm more likely to be able to talk my wife into that than, say, going to a convention in Ohio. <laughs> yes, it's exactly the same with my wife. Uh, when we went to San Diego, we went together for an academic conference. And, uh, yeah, we had a great time. And we clambered around on uh, the, uh, the aircraft carrier, the floating museum right. there, which was great. Well, great. Well, we're here today to talk about uh, modern urban combat. And um, I mean, you have BGG lists you as having 64 published designs. I'm sure you have more that are unpublished or, or maybe print and play. I don't, I don't know if it lists everything you ever did in your, uh, in your mail order uh, days as well. But I, I looked through those titles and I would say by far the majority of your work is in the post-World War II uh, time frame. So you, in terms of modern urban combat, that's that's your 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 thing. What what is it that drives that draws you to the the modern era as opposed to more historical design? Well, it kind of goes back to uh, when I first started in wargaming, um, which is about 1979, 1980. So I've been at this for over you know, 40 years. <clears throat> but from the very beginning, once I got involved in wargaming. There were always, uh, there was always a lack of games. I was always interested in contemporary political uh, issues and contemporary warfare, that kind of thing. And back in 1979, 1980, there were very few games uh, that were on contemporary issues. Anything that happened after World War II, even um, there were there are very very few games on Vietnam, for example. You know, the Vietnam War had only recently ended. And it was still very much a taboo subject, you know, in the, in American culture, you know, of course, but also in in board game publishing as well. Um, so I'd always been interested in that kind of thing. And when it came around to uh, me starting to design my own games, which I started doing around uh, about thirty years ago, a little over thirty years ago, I, I decided I would just start designing the kind of games that I wanted to play. And you know, make more of what I wanted to see in the world. And was uh, you know it, that makes me think that uh, you were intensely interested in the politics as well as the kinetics of what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, un unless you're playing a completely you know tactical game or you know some kind of very rivet county uh, naval game or something like that, uh, there's always above a certain scale, there's always some kind of political motivation for, for what, you know, is going on. Like if you're playing like Tobruk or something like that, you know, the political balance of power in the Mediterranean, it has nothing to do with the penetrative powers of a two pounder gun, of course. Right. Uh, yeah. But then there's the whole reason of, you know, why are you in North Africa shooting with your two pounder gun, you know, at some Italians, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And so, uh, you know, when I do operational level and, and especially strategic level games, that's where politics and the military cross paths. And some of my earlier designs were on things like the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and, but I've also designed an awful lot of stuff on irregular warfare, uh, you know, like uh, like uh, national liberation struggles, uh, domestic uh, political movements, 
uh, urban gorillas. I'll be talking about that in a little while. Uh, you know, things like that. And those are, of course, you know, equally political struggles, uh, political as well as military. Yeah, it, I, I remember, you know, I, I'm, I'm the same vintage as you. And I remember in the early 80s, I was hesitant to play the even the few uh, Vietnam games that were there because the politics of it all still felt so raw to me. And there was, in some ways, there was a like a fear, almost a fear on my part that I was going to open a game and it was going to it was going to rug me the wrong way politically or something. That it was I don't know going to be too jingoistic or too black and white, not nuanced enough. I don't know. There was it took me a long time to to play my first Vietnam game for sure. Mm -hmm. I started collecting Vietnam games from a very early age. Uh, and at the time, about the only person who was designing them uh, was uh, Perry Moore, who did this stuff in like proto, proto desktop publishing. <laughs> this was yeah. even before computers. This was letter set typing and photocopying and you know you got a, a counter on those little a, letters with the letter set yeah that's right and you and everything was photocopied and the counter sheet was you know something with a swipe of pink highlighter and green highlighter on it you know that that kind of thing uh but he did just he didn't do political stuff he did stuff on on like battle level games uh or campaign level games about vietnam the first game that incorporated vietnam that i ever played um, was uh, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, by Victory Games uh, by Nick Karp, uh, oh, which was just a brilliant game. And of course, Compass Games has just come out with a reissue of it. And, and it's, it's a brilliant a design. Kind of, uh, in the field, that, that yep. game is sort of the towering yeah. game. And and yet it's it's only partly a political uh, game because there there's it had more politics in it than any other Vietnam game at the time, uh, but it just dealt with things like the competency of whoever was was premier of, of Vietnam at the time, and then the polit the internal the small p politics between corps commanders you know and, and division commanders making them effective and ineffective and that kind of thing, and then there was kind of a pacification kind of thing which wasn't really political but you know, but 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 acknowledged sort of the village level war that wasn't represented by the cardboard, you know, counters for battalions and regiments that were, uh, you know, milling around on on on, um, on the map itself. Uh, the last Consum World Expo uh, I went to, uh, I finally got to meet Nick Carp. This was the first one he'd ever been to. I think this is 2019. It was before COVID, just before COVID. And uh, I was so happy to meet Car uh, Nick and, and talk to him because, you know, uh, I, I just uh, really, really enjoyed that. But then, you know, that was 1990, that was 1985. And it was only a few years after that, that I started to see more games that had more politics in them or were about irregular warfare at all without being, you know, tactical or battle level games. And that's the work of Joe Miranda. So for sure. example, Joe's game, Nicaragua, which came out in 1988. Joe's game on Nicaragua was a designer's riposte, I think, or response to another game that Victory Games put out called Central America. Right. And you talk about politics there. There's a man, you know, a designer with a definite political agenda, and it bled into the design of the game. And the design of the game, it, it, it's a game about a guerrilla warfare that somehow managed to elide all of the politics. And instead, it's a game of just how many Marine brigades do you need to bust through into Managua? Or how many, you know, uh, tank regiments do you need to bust through Honduras and go for the Rio Grande? Um, so it was only half a game, you know, for this kind of thing. Um, well, so I think that, that the, 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 the counterinsurgency side the units were sort of treated as if they were organized more like regular brigades and yep. things. Yep, so very. It was given very short shrift, and you know, of, the whole idea of, of like the the passive uh, part of the, of a movement that that supports the guerrilla movement that was that was completely absent. Yeah, it's, it, 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 when you think of the when when I think of the these those sorts of conflicts, the Central American ones, the asymmetry is is the key the key part of it. Yep. And uh, if you make both sides somewhat the same, that's you're kind of missing the the whole point of the conflict in a way. Yep, it was. That's that's how I felt about it, and it was just a, a kind of a counting rifles exercise. Now, technically, 
it was, you know, quite sophisticated, you know, as it had a pretty sophisticated engine for operational level combat, you know, in the air warfare modules and stuff like that. But still, you know, that's just the kinetic part, you know, the political part was was just absent, you know, aside from, you know, the the the, the agenda of the rules writer, which came through pretty clearly, you know, in his designer's notes and that kind right. of thing. Yeah, yeah. So did you, so you, you mentioned Joe Miranda, you, you, started working on counterinsurgency and and uh, modern g games at that time as well. So long before we had the, the coin series, I, I know you have two titles uh, in the coin series as well, but you'd been working on, the coin series was kind of a good fit for you because you'd spent 15 or 20 years working on in that field already, yes? Yeah, well, in effect, the, the coin series actually is partly inspired by my own work. Um, right. You know this. Right. This goes. This goes back a ways. You know anybody who's familiar with it. Um, if you have a copy of Andea and Abyss, and you read the designer's notes, um, you can see that uh, Volko acknowledges that uh, a game that I had done on the Algerian War uh, was uh, part of the inspiration for his thinking when he designed the coin system. Right. And. Uh, yeah, for a long time, Joe Miranda and I were about the, you know, uh, two of the very few people who were producing work in this kind of thing. And I thought even after 9-11 that there'd be some kind of upsurge of, of interest for serious games uh, or analysis, game-based analysis of, um, of, of, of um, you know, of terrorism and counterinsurgency and that kind of thing, but it just, it didn't materialize. And it wasn't until like 2007 that I was contacted by somebody who was then working in the office of the Secretary of Defense, saying how he had used a game, my my one of my games on Algeria, uh, as the basis for a game he was putting together to model the insurgency that was then bubbling away in Iraq. And uh, I was in, he invited me to a conference of the Military Operations Research Society on irregular warfare because at the time they were working on uh, a, an American army manual on counterinsurgency. And so that was what all these analysts were coming to discuss that and many other things. But part of it, you know, was, was games. And I met a colleague of Volko's uh, at, this, uh, at this conference. Um, and uh, this is when Volko was not retired from the CIA, CIA yet. He was uh, still teaching at the Sherman Kent School for Analysis, which is where they, you know, teach their analysts. And this colleague of Volko's, uh, what we did was afterwards we uh, worked out a simplified rapid fire version of my Algeria game that he could use in his classroom. And Volko uh, found uh, this guy using this game in his classroom and he thought, oh, this looks interesting. And then, you know, he looked at it and then again, so then the coin system. And then, of course, uh, a year or two after and and Abyss came out, um, Volko and I worked together on a distant plane. And then after that came out, uh, GMT asked me to uh, do a game on the Algerian war using the GMT coin system. Uh, and that's Colonial Twilight. Right. Which, where you kind of uh, took the whole thing and put it on its head by making the first coin game that only had two sides instead of four or yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's, uh, that, that's, yeah, crack in the two-body problem, I called it. And it, it actually wasn't all that difficult. It just needed uh, to be visualized in a, in a somewhat different way. And uh, since then, you know, I, I, I figured out, you, you know, you, this, the, this method can be applied to the four-player coin system games so that you could possibly play them with two, you know, using that Colonial Twilight mechanism. Um, uh, or uh, I also made up a, a four-player variant for Colonial Twilight. So if you have four people who want to play, but you only have one game, then you right. can play four-player. Yeah. Just, just for fun. And so... Um, you did those coin games, but now you, you've also, you've done a series, like to, to focus things a little bit more on the urban side, you've done some games with Hollenspiel now that, now the, the, like a, the Kandahar game, is is that getting close to, uh, closer to what we're talking about today? Well, uh, the, I've published four uh, volumes uh, in what I call the district commander system through right. Hollenspiel. Uh, the first one is called District Commander Maracas, and it's the urban counterinsurgency uh, setting for that particular system. And I'll be talking about it later. Uh, the, the other three volumes uh, followed in the, the that, that, that came out in 2019. 
and uh, the other three volumes followed, and they're set in uh, Binh Dinh province in Vietnam in 1969, uh, Algeria in 1959, and then Kandahar in 2009, Kandahar province of Afghanistan. So these are all rural applications. It's all the same basic system. It's almost like the old SPI quadra game system, you know, where you had a basic core rule set, and then you had these exclusive rules that added right. and subtracted and changed details. Um, but to me, urban warfare, urban, especially urban irregular warfare, has always been a really important topic for me. And that's why I did the Maracas module first. Right. Uh, so it was it, the first to be published. Three a little bit. It, it's 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 a setting. It, it's the urban one. The other three are more rural. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I wanted it to be published first. Uh, and not only is it still on sale from Holland Spiel, but you can also get a free print and play copy of, uh, the, oh, right. of the Maracas game on my personal website. Uh, I know you'll be putting up a, uh, a, a uh, yeah, URL the, from my website later. The URL, is, uh, it's, it's already up in the show notes, but we'll, uh, we'll place it on the screen as well. You Thank you. Um, now, uh, the only difference between that one and the one that was published is that it uses my artwork, uh, which is pretty, pretty, pretty basic. <laughs> uh, it still games the game, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I uh, but, a big guy on components. It's it's gameplay all the way for me. Yeah. So I don't know. My my art style is is not very demanding, you know. But it it, it gets the job done. And uh, yeah, I have a whole page on my website uh, that's free games. So it's like nine or ten of my designs that you can download for free uh, for free print and play. Uh, mm -hmm. And Maracas is one of them. So if you're interested in uh, how the system as a whole works, then you can download all of the stuff there. You can also download the rule books. Uh, for those games uh, from their board game geek entries, uh, so that uh, you can have a look at, at how it, uh, what kind of things it looks at. Well, as a side note, you must be a big fan of those uh, old SPI quads because you also have the brief Border Wars series at Compass that basically is those quads as well. Yep, I love those old quad games, and I decided I'd try and bring back the quad on my own. Uh, so that's Brief Border Wars Volume 1 came out two years ago, and Brief Great, Border uh, Wars uh, Volume 2, yeah. it'll be out by the end of the year, I think. Yeah, can't wait for it. It's great. Yeah, and I also see that uh, Compass Games has put out, uh, I think it's called an East Front Battles uh, quad. So yeah. someone else is is working on, on that as well. And I think uh, Mark Herman, is he's taken that that series, that, that system he made his uh, his simple Gettysburg game and he's gonna do four four or five more uh, Civil War games and publish them as a quad or a quint, I don't know which. Yeah. But it's, uh, I think that's coming out as well. So so yes. uh, we're going back to the 80s. Well, and that's, Mark, and Mark Herman was there, you know, too, back in the day <laughs> you know, right. when that's he was right. working on that. Um, I don't know if he designed any games for the original quads, uh, but he, he may well have, or may have developed them. And there's another point. We were talking a couple minutes ago about the coin system. Uh, I have to mention uh, the British way, which is Stephen Reganza's uh, simplified look at coin. Uh, at four different uh, counterinsurgency campaigns uh, that was kind of the decline of the British Empire. That's right, coming yes, out yes. Soon from GMT. But again, that's the same idea. You've got your basic rules, uh, which is like the, 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 uh, the coin system stripped down to its ultimate fundamentals. And then, you know, uh, it's got different uh, give and take for, you know, Kenya and Cyprus and Palestine. Uh, you know, those campaigns. I'm looking forward to that very much. I've never met Stephen, but I've talked to him a couple times online. He's a very intelligent guy. Yeah, I, uh, there's a lot of buzz about that game as everybody's waiting for it, I think. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it because I did the first game on the Cyprus emergency, and now Stephen's coming out with the second, and I'm sure his is much more playable. Mine's rather intricate. <laughs> the, um, I guess... Um... When we look at, um, going back to what we were talking uh, about a little bit earlier, when we were talking about, you know, gaining modern subjects, and there are some people who are a little skittish about that. They like to keep their history deep in the history. Um, but you, you're obviously the other side of that, uh, the other side of that equation. What is it about gaming modern topics that uh, appeals to you, or, or what makes you think that, that it's a, a worthwhile and relevant thing to do? Uh, because it's what's happening now, baby. 
<laughs> you know, uh, I'm interested in the world around me. I'm interested in the whys and wherefores of how the world around me came to be. Um, and I think that if we can study and learn from games uh, about contemporary topics, then we can come to a more, uh, you know, to a, a better understanding of them, you know, maybe a more holistic one, or just understanding how complex things can be. Um, we, I could even call it a more experiential one because people are kind of like playing through, you know, a game and kind of generating a narrative as they go. Um, there's, I have this whole <clears throat> thing on the go about um, game design being a form of amateur, of citizen journalism, because right. from from time to time I have uh, designed games on contemporary topics while they were happening or very soon after they were happening. A Distant Plane, for example, um, Voco and I designed that in 2012, 2013, and uh, the game went up to the point where NATO was ending its combat mission in 2014. So when it was published, that part of the war still had a year to run. Right. Um, I designed a game on the Battle of Seattle, which were these, um, you know, these uh, anti-WTO riots in Seattle yeah. in, at the end of 1999. Within a couple of weeks, I had a design put together a game about that. And then uh, in 2014, over the very weekend of the um, uh, Crimean referendum, uh, and when it looked very likely that there was going to be a large and overt Russian invasion of Crimea and the Ukraine, within 48 hours, I had <clears throat> a um, political military information warfare game on three fronts, you know, put together uh, and uh, had it up on my website. And that was called Ukrainian Crisis. It was on print and play for a while. Uh, and uh, later on, it was published by Holland Spiel as well. But it, again, it's also available on my website for free. Uh, oh yes, I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Brand, yes. The I, I think I, I think I saw that uh, David Doctor and uh, Mark Herman are working on something on the current Russian Soviet uh, Russian uh, <clears throat> Ukraine conflict as well. So you're not alone in this sort of um, designing as events unfold. Yeah, I saw the pictures of that, and, and that looks interesting. But, you know, again, it's an operational warfare, and a mainly kinetic look at things is my impression. Um, with my 2014 game, um, the military combat end of things was really, really abstracted. You know, it was a, 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 an area movement game with not very many areas on it. Um, everything was kind of abstracted at about the brigade, you know, and regiment level. And uh, what was important in the game was not military conquest so much as it was uh, gaining and retaining um, prestige, which could be earned and lost on the military front or on the diplomatic front or on the information warfare front. And I'm right. sure people have, have understood very clearly that, in the, that uh, in the current war, Ukraine has scored an absolute victory on the information warfare front. And they've done well in the diplomatic front as well. You know, and things are maybe, you know, kind of up in the air in the military. And, you know, maybe ultimately that will be the one that will tell. But um, it just it's just underlining that these dimensions of the conflict are really important as well. And I'd also like to note, you know, the game that I did in 2014 is really only appropriate for about the first six months of the crisis when it looked like there was going to be, you know, a large and overt Russian invasion. And it goes up to the time of the first Minsk agreement. And at that time, the historical result in game terms would be more or less a draw, but we'll have a rematch later. And um, here we are, eight years later, we are. having a rematch. Well, I guess the, I think that kind of gets us up to, uh, we should talk about your latest work. You've, you've got this new system called QUIC, and you've been uh, doing some teaching with the US Army, the 40th Inter Infantry Division, or I think I got that right. Um, yes. So um, I, we should talk about that, and I, I think you have some uh, some slides to show us, and and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, you can walk us through that. Yeah. Or um, you want to sure. I mean, well, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the quick game a little bit, uh, but I, I have a talk here where I'm going to talk through uh, six or seven other um, games on uh, modern urban warfare because they're they're kind of a continuum, kind of like a well, not a ludology, but but sort of like um, kind of the evolution of many of my ideas about uh, modern urban warfare. Perfect. So if, if if that's okay, but yeah, I'll, I'll, it's maybe some background on the quick first. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I guess I um, 
happened to to come across notice that the um, the 40 the American 40th Infantry Division, which is the uh, California Army National Guard, um, they're responsible for uh, I guess well uh, the whole West Coast, but also you know the Pacific Islands and Hawaii as well. The National Guard formations there, um, but they were putting together. Um, uh, the uh, the first serial of what was called the Urban Operations Planners Course. And this is due to the efforts of uh, the, the Deputy General for Operations uh, in the division. His name is Brigadier General Robert Woldrich. And General Woldrich is very, very interested in urban warfare. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the American Army is waking up, uh, I think a little belatedly, but now they're becoming fully aware and fully alerted to how much fighting there's likely to be in cities in the future and how complicated and how awful it is potentially. So General Wooldridge, together with Colonel John Spencer, uh, who has also uh, been ringing the bell for uh, urban warfare for a long time now, the two of them put this course together with a few um, other people from the School of Advanced Military Soci um, Studies and um, the uh, Defense Sciences Technical Laboratory in the UK. And they put together this course and what they did on the final day of the course was they played a game and it was just a one-off uh, bunch of people standing around a large map kind of uh, exercise. But it was organized by Lieutenant Colonel Luke Gygax, who was one of Gary Gygax's sons. Um, he, uh, <laughs> what a world. Yeah, and what a world indeed, you know. So uh, they put, he, you know, Colonel Gygax, well, Colonel, he's retired from the guard now. Uh, but at the time, uh, he put this ex gaming exercise together for the general. And uh, it was like one of those one-off kind of free-form exercises. And he was a little bit like the dungeon master in that people would talk about their moves. And then he would roll dice and say, okay, well, that did right. very well. And now you've got this. Or, oh, this slipped up. You've, you've lost popular support over here, this kind of thing. But it was kind of um, the kind of thing that could only be done once um, and, and only by the entire group. And so uh, they were going to run the, the, the game, uh, the, sorry, the, the course a second time. And General Wooldridge reached out to the professional wargaming community and he asked if there were somebody out there who could design some kind of a, you know, like a commission game that would talk about, you know, urban warfare uh, and would reinforce the points of the course uh, of what it had to teach, uh, but without being super detailed or super complex to play. And Brant Gilry gave him uh, my name, and I started talking to the general at the end of 2021. And I put together um, actually two different games for him, um, and the quick is one of them. And that is the one that we played uh, when um, for the second serial of the course, which was in July of 2022. Uh, there's another serial coming up in May uh, of this year, so in about two months from now. And I'll be going back down to uh, Los Alamitos in California to uh, attend the course and teach the game again. Uh, how long did it take you to design it? Well, um, as I said, I designed two games. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was I, I, guess, I guess every designer finds that with many designs, you start complex and then you start thinning down and thinning down and streamlining. And so that was kind of the process. Um, I started in designing a game based on some ideas I had had for several years. Um, I called this the scalable urban simulation. And the idea here was that uh, it was a game about urban conflict, but it had sort of like basically this almost the same idea of basic rules, um, like in a quad, uh, but also with exclusive rules or special rules for different scales of action. So you could have a module of the game that was like division level. So it would be a division operating in a city and the uh, maneuver units would be battalions grouped into brigades. Or you could have a brigade level simulation, which would be a brigade operating in not a big city or a section of a big city. And they'd be uh, maneuvering companies. And then you could have a battalion level one. Uh, you know, where you're maneuvering platoons and assets and that kind of thing. But you have the same basic rules for the same basic actions. You know, the idea of resources and planning and effort flowing through headquarters and command posts out to the maneuver units. Um, and then the maneuver units trying to do their best to get things accomplished 
in a very frictional environment. And the more bashed up and tired they get, the harder it is for them to get anything done. Well, I, I only asked about uh, how long it took you because it seems in some of your designs, you you dash off the 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 knot of it quite quickly. And then it's the, the core is right there. And then the more time takes feathering away all the unnecessary, but it, it seems like, like once you have an idea, you're, you're just like, boom, right on it in a week or something. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I should have answered your question the simple way. <laughs> my dad always <laughs> used to say, my dad always <laughs> used to say to me, he said, you know, never ask Brian the time. He'll tell you how to build a watch. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's that's how long-winded and verbose I can be. So the that's short right. answer is uh, six months for the two games. Right. Yeah. So the okay. first the first game took uh, you know about two two months to design, uh, and yeah. but I realized once I had had it whipped into shape that it was too involved, and so I you know I consulted with the general and uh, the chief of training uh, um, for for the division and worked out something that was much simpler. And it's actually based on War Chest, which is a sort of abstract war game that uh, is popular with a lot of people. Um, some of the basic ideas in that, but I've changed everything else. And then, you know, made a version of that. And then there was, uh, we ended up making kind of a, like an introductory or level zero, you know, version of that game. Because the, while the students on the course, many of them are senior military officers or, se you know, NCOs with an awful lot of service. They're highly intelligent and motivated and educated people. But for many of them, these war games that, you know, we have taught ourselves to play almost naturally, it's something very, very far out of some people's sphere of experience. Right. I, I was wondering, how, like, what the, in, in, what the, their level of play and understanding is compared to a, an average war gamer. It must, I mean, like you say, we're so used to this, but mm -hmm. they're like people coming into the hobby that they, that you can't just start playing Pacific War <laughs> without having played something uh, leading up to it, right? Yeah, and a lot of them, you know, fairly have a, an attitude about games and using games in education and training that is kind of reflective of the general cultural attitude we have towards games, that games are for fun and they're trivial and they're almost childish exercises. Um, but I think we managed to to change a few minds with that, because um, at the end of the day, when we ran that uh, game, uh, we had a whole day to play the game uh, on in, in July. Um, there was a um, a British lieutenant colonel. He was like uh, from the legal branch, like the head lawyer for the third UK division or something like that. He said he stood up and he said, you know, I had always dismissed games as having any value at all for training or education or what have you but you sir you have blown my mind <laughs> so well, that was nice to hear i love to hear and congratulations on the comment but I, I you know i get how there there's the wider thing about thinking they're childish things and and whatnot but also like there's a there's a history in the military of using games to game out possible situations yep. all the you know the case blue case, case yellow or you know uh what have you? Uh, War plan Pacific. All these things are—they're not just plans. They're also—they also game them out to, mm -hmm. to see if they were feasible, right? No, nope, exactly. I mean, I mean, that's where the whole hobby of civilian wargaming came from. Is Charles Roberts, you know, in his original tactics game in the late 1950s, he produced that because he wanted to design a game that would he thought would maybe give him a leg up, you know, in uh, uh, getting a commission in the reserve officers. Core, right? Um, it's because you know he, he was. He, I guess he was interested enough in the subject to try and put something together that you know would be pleasant to play, um, and and would have some kind of professional value or educational value for for officer training, and that's where that came from. And of course, everything is just kind of snowballed from there. <laughs> and also, that you know, in terms of the uh, the non childish or not like the, the the stereotypes about games. I mean. I'm sure that the vast majority of people interested in in conflict simulation games that we play are also really deeply interested in history or and or politics. Uh, so the 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 playfulness is is part of it, but it's you know there's some serious study going on there too, and and desire to learn and and understand you know why something you know why Gettysburg 
happened the way it did or, you know, whatever you happen to be gaining. Yeah. And that brings me back to the point that we were discussing, you know, a few minutes ago. And, you know, it's it's a commonplace that every war gamer, every, you know, every war gamer was really into it, not just for like the social aspect or the, you know, the, the game aspect of it. They all have an, an interest in history. And many of them have deep and encyclopedic knowledge of certain periods of history, you know, like the American Civil War, or even focusing on one battle. You know, right. like uh, Danny Parker, for example, most of he's his design Bulge. career, he's Mr. Bulge. Yeah. Uh, so he knows so much about that campaign. But the conclusion I came to some time ago is that um, war gamers, by and large, don't seem to be any more interested in contemporary warfare or contemporary right. political issues than non-war gamers. You know, some are, and some of them are very, very interested in it, but there are a lot that simply aren't, which is why the games that I've been designing over the years uh, are just, you know, some of them are still the only examples of a game model of certain of these conflicts. I'm the only one who's bothered. Uh, and uh, Joe Miranda, you know, a lot of his political games, of course, are the same kind of thing, uh, you know, and th there are, you know, there have been thousands of, of, of board war games published over the years. And I think that I tried counting it once and fewer than 100 dealt seriously with um, with with modern conflict and maybe fewer than 30 dealt seriously with irregular warfare, like modern, really modern period, irregular warfare. And Joe and I were responsible for most of those titles. Right. We weren't the only ones, but, you know, it, it's, uh, we have more company now, but back then, you know. No, back then, and it, back then, it seemed like also a lot of that, what little focus there was on modern things was like Cold War gone hot, Topics. There was just an endless amount of that. It felt like, as and it's all coming, to... and it's all coming back. You know, right. in the last five to ten years, we've seen this wave of of weird retro nostalgia. It was for, nostalgia for that. Yeah, it's nostalgia for a future that never was. That's which right. To me, yeah. is deeply weird. I, I totally <laughs> you know? agree. But people want to play full the gap. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the hobby is is still we're still in the grips of a lot of nostalgia. You know, people kind of uh, they want to they, they want to get that feeling again of when they were in their 20s and uh, the kind of when people were starting out, you know, and, and the fun that you had playing and discovering these games, the fun you had playing with your friends, that well, kind of stuff. It's um, I understand it. You know, it's, I, understand I can it understand too. where I'm the motivation's coming from. I'm susceptible to it as well, for sure. Like sometimes I look at Toe Brook on my shelf and go, I really had a pull that out again. And then I go, oh, do I really want to roll that many dice for penetration values and hits yep. and whatnot? But yep. my uh, wrist is still hurting right. from that. That's right. But we should move forward then and go into the future or go in, not, not, the, not the future, forget the future. Let's go into the present and uh, and uh, have a look at your, uh, at your presentation and, and we'll talk about things that are actually happening now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Grant. So uh, again, in broad terms, what I'd like to do is I'd just like to move quickly through um, descriptions of eight uh, games that I've done on modern level urban conflict at the operational scale. And uh, I'll, I'll try and get that as, as quickly as I can. And thankfully, we can go over the hour. So if anybody has any questions, uh, I'd be pleased to, to, to uh, talk about them. Um, okay, so here we go with the streaming, or sorry, the screen share. There we are. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay, up, down, down, down. Examples of war games on operational warfare. So, um, I, as we were talking, um, I've spent a fair amount of time designing war games dealing on the topic of urban warfare. And I just uh, like to spend some time talking about them. So first of all, you know, we'll be talking about war games on modern urban warfare at the operational scale. So first of all, why war games? Well, that's what we're all here for today. And why modern urban warfare? Because as I said, that's what's, that's what's happening now, baby. And I think it's crucial to study this form of contemporary conflict. Um, here are some examples of some recent books that have been published uh, on the situation. Um, one of them, the one in the top right corner there by David Kilcullen called Out of the Mountains is a really good book. Uh, the, actually, all of these books are excellent. 
uh, but for a good introduction, uh, a well-written introduction to the topic, I, I recommend this uh, Out of the Mountains by David Kilcullen. Um, so to make a very long and very good story short, um, he makes the following points in the book. Most of the world's population now lives in littoral cities. You know, they're on or very close to major bodies of water. And many of them are mega cities of 10 million people or more. Um, the world just keeps getting more and more urban. There's increasing crowding, increasing wealth inequality, more strain on resources and infrastructure that's inadequate. Uh, and of course, climate change makes it more and more likely that there's going to be widespread disorder and insurgent violence in and around these cities. And um, you know, if you want to know more about that, I recommend Planet of Slums, uh, which is uh, another book there in the lower left corner there by Mike Davis, uh, another very good book. And the point is, is that governments of whatever stripe or structure have to anticipate this kind of development or they risk becoming failed states and eaten up by this, these same factors of disorder and chaos. So modern urban warfare is very, you know, it's, I think it's a crucial contemporary topic that we need to understand and to study and to understand it through games. And why operational scale? Now, there are a lot of uh, modern period tactical level games. Uh, where I say tactical level, the maneuver units that you're using in the game are platoons down to individual troops uh, that take place in cities, but I'm not gonna talk about them. Instead, games where the maneuver units are battalions to brigades, that's the echelon where the interesting things happen in my view. The game system uh, needs to start reflecting on questions of logistics and sustainment for the battalions and brigades, which are like the smallest of the all arms formations. Um, you have to think about difficulties with the civilian population, uh, protection and exploitation of urban infrastructure and so on. These factors usually don't pop up in tactical games or they're treated quite differently. Um, I've always liked to design at this scale, not only because it's necessary to include these forgotten aspects, but also to put the player in the role of a mid-level commander who has the agency to select and pursue, you know, some complicated objectives, but he still has to respect direction from above. Now, this table that I put together here, these are examples of operational scale war games on irregular battles. Here's another one on, uh, well, let's call them force on force urban battles. Um, the first thing you'll notice, of course, is that there aren't very many of these games at all. There's less than 30 out of the hundreds of modern period war games that have been published, I, I, I've identified less than 30 that are operational scale urban conflict. And irregular conflicts dominate. The first table, of course, is much larger than the other and more detailed. And the force on force battles practically, well, all of them are hypothetical uh, because we don't really yet know how a modern city fight, a stand up city fight would go between two regular armies. Um, we have examples that are kind of edge cases, uh, like, you know, Hue or Beirut uh, or Mosul. Uh, but these are examples of intense urban battles, but they've been against an enemy that's largely insurgent. Now, another thing that you should notice about this table is while these games all have about the same scale of units, so the maneuver units are battalions to regiments or brigades, there's very large variations on time and space relations. Um, some games, uh, for example, have, uh, you know, three turns per day. Some are daily turns uh, and some are up to two weeks or they're just abstract, depending on the amount of action that's going on in the turn. And there's similar variations in map scale, whether it's a hex map or an area map. Um, and I think it's right to reflect on the complexity and the density of urban terrain and the intensity of urban action. Um, especially since uh, the pace of urban battles also often seems to resemble uh, almost like medieval sieges. You have long periods of probing and attrition and set up with short bursts of combat. But another thing that I'd like to note um, in this particular table of force on force urban battles is the use of the SPI modern battles quadra game system. Grant and I were talking earlier about the quads and uh, two of the best known SPI era quadra games were modern battles and modern battles two. And some of the modern battles uh, games were set in urban areas uh, or uh, they had maps where a large city was like a major objective for both sides. There was one, Berlin 85, which came out in 1980 by James Dunnigan that took place entirely within West Berlin. Uh, and that's a fascinating game. Uh, it's one of SPI's 
very few experiments in strictly urban warfare. Um, and uh, But in my view, the modern battle system that was used to drive the game system was really not fitted uh, for urban combat. Um, now, Joe Miranda did work some adaptations into the system in 2016 and 2017 when he made some changes to the basic modern battle system. But basically, it's still the same system as it was in 1975, with a combat results table that's way too dependent on mobility, outflanking, retreats, and exchange type results, which I think is okay for open country, but not for the intensity and the force concentration of urban combat. And it doesn't really um, acknowledge the complexity of terrain within the city. Now, I think this can be rectified with a couple of simple rule changes. Uh, I made a variant the other day for Berlin 85 that I think addresses some of this. And you can ask me about this later if you're interested. But really, I think it's time to stop using this 50-year-old system for these kinds of battles and move to some more innovative mechanisms, you know, which we do have a plenty. And so I'm going to start by talking a few of these uh, other ones that, that I've done. Um, so in 1994, I designed a two-player game called Tupamaro uh, on the urban guerrilla movement of that name that was active in Uruguay from 1968 to 1972. Um, this uh, guerrilla movement grew, lived, and died largely in the city of Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay, and which at the time was about the size of Phoenix, Arizona, about a million and a half or two million people. Um, I'll be talking about these games in terms of their entities and activities in, in each game. So first I'll talk about the entities that are involved in the game. You know, think of this as like the people currency of the game. And secondarily, uh, it's act, the, you know, the activities that are carried out in the game or call it the action currency. So the people currency interacts with the action currency and that how the two of those interact uh, in the game uh, is, is, is how the game is played out. So for Tupamaros, um, you have, uh, like other guerrilla groups, the Tupamaros were organized into uh, fire teams, or uh, they had a cellular structure of four to five people. And this, of course, in the game is the main unit of people currency. Uh, they also have infiltrators uh, who represent like agents or secret groups within larger organizations uh, and dummies, uh, just to keep the government uh, guessing. And meanwhile, the government player, uh, they have uh, individual informers, but they also have uh, companies and battalions of uh, police, which are blue units, and army, which are green units, uh, as you can see in the counter sheet there. Now, the, the action currency in the game is uh, administrative points, you know, maybe not a very imaginative title, uh, but that's the unit of currency in the game. And to get anything in the game done, you need lots of them. Uh, they quantify a number of things, anything from time spent planning an, or, uh, an operation or expenditure of supplies or explosives, uh, planning, time, all kinds of things. And they're generated by a number of activities which are different for each side. So this was a game that's quite asymmetric between the two sides. Uh, you know, where, how they're represented in the game, where their wherewithal comes from, and so forth. And what they do is you combine, you know, the people currency and the action currency and you use them to carry out missions. And the gain quantifiable result of missions is usually the gain or loss of political support. Um, so you have uh, measures of, of, uh, of, of uh, that's the political support level down here. Uh, and what you do is each player maintains a political support level that's independently of the other. And you, by showing this in a non-zero-sum faction, then you can model, you know, maybe a highly polarized or committed society, uh, which is where both sides would have a high uh, political, uh, political support level. Or an apathetic society would be one where both sides have a very low uh, political support level, where people are largely sick of the fighting and don't care about what's going on. And of course, you can, you, you can work anything in between. And the ultimate prize in the game is political legitimacy through apparent strength. And the way you win the game is by driving the other guy's political support level down to zero. Um, and time and space are an important dimension, of course, as they are in every game. This is the map for Tupamaro. It is a non-representational map. All of the action, as I said, took place inside Montevideo, the capital city, which is where about half of the population of the country lived back then. Both sides were fighting not for domination of a physical space or to even to establish any kind of a temporary liberated area, but for the allegiance of certain social groups. 
And the conflict was as close as you could go to a pure war of class interests as you could get at the time. So instead of a, a map of the city, I made a map of its social sector areas. And uh, you, through this, I managed to avoid the kind of time and space dilemmas that a lot of war game designers uh, have to face up to. Um, so again, what's happening in the game is a certain amount of activity that's uh, to a greater or lesser degree can be spread out over a very long period of time. And it's something that's affecting a particular social sector or, or a, a socioeconomic area of the city, not a geographical area as such, although people drive around and do stuff and rob actual banks. Uh, but what they're trying to do is affect the attitudes of uh, certain social sectors. So designing this game was helpful because it helped me to articulate and organize my thoughts and my readings on low level urban combat, especially on terrorism, counterterrorism. And this game was the genesis of five other games that I did uh, about insurgency, and they range from Cyprus and Algeria in the 1950s uh, up to Kandahar province in, tw uh, in 2010. So this system engendered, you know, about five or six other games. And in 2002, um, there was a micro game design contest on BoardGameGeek, and my entry was a game uh, called Operation Whirlwind, which was uh, about the Soviet incursion into Budapest in November of 1956 to crush the Hungarian Revolution. And this was a very different scenario in that you still had an irregular force fighting against a regular force, uh, but this one was a, a completely lopsided militarily. It had no real, uh, it didn't have much of a political dimension, but it was all kinetic action. So there's no question of contending you know, political legitimacy or acceptance. This is the Soviets just suppressing rebellion in a vassal state. And so things were so lopsided militarily that there was no possibility of a Hungarian military victory. But what my concept here was to do was to put together a high speed, highly kinetic game that showed the great asymmetries of size and firepower and methods between the two sides while trying to maintain some kind of excitement and suspense in a, a very much a kind of a last stand situation. So um, again, entities, the Soviet units are shown at uh, battalion or regiment scale, and the insurgents, which are the green units, uh, are shown at roughly platoon scale, and they have different scales, uh, or, or sorry, different uh, grades of insurgents. So there's uh, recruits uh, to militia, to sappers, you know, they're, they're increasingly more experienced or better trained or better equipped. Um, another option I included in the series, if you have a look there, uh, is the blue units, um, which was showed progressive degrees of American intervention from arms drops to special forces units uh, to the 101st Airborne dropping into Budapest. Um, now, this is one of the few games, maybe the first to show an American division uh, organized in uh, the uh, Pentomic uh, division organization, which some people may remember or remember reading about uh, where the division wasn't divided into three parts, but into five battle groups. Now, this was something that was rooted in pretty close to fantasy um, because it, it was really highly improbable and probably not even possible. Uh, it's just there as an interesting alternative because if they'd actually done this, it probably would have caused World War III. Um, in the game, both sides have an incentive to fight. The Soviets are under extreme time pressure to crush the resistance as quickly as they can. And the Hungarians, uh, the insurgents, the, the harder they fight, the more weapons they capture, uh, and by which they use to arm their own forces, and they cause more and more victory point losses to Soviet units. Um, we also had some command and control restrictions. Uh, there were three Soviet divisions entered the city. They're not allowed to cooperate with each other. Um, and also uh, there's fog of war. Uh, if the Soviet player is not careful, he may end up attacking an inverted Hungarian unit, which turns out to be uh, a crowd of civilians. And of course, if you massacre civilians, that's going to cost you some considerable uh, victory points. And then finally, um, as I said, the Soviets are under very strict time pressure to try and finish this up as possible. They win the game by defeating the insurgency and taking uh, control of these Red Star objective points. And uh, once they've occupied all of that, uh, then the game is over and they win. Um, so the area map 
the map is an area map about 300 yards to the inch and the historical length of the battle is about 100 hours so we're uh divided into uh two or three turns per day uh and the game is over in about 10 to 12 turns so this is the first war game I did on a fully kinetic urban battle. And over time, it had a few different editions. It started as a free print and play game. And what you're seeing here is the folio presentation of the game with some nice art and nicely made die cut counters from uh, one small step. And this game is still available. Now, years later, I discovered a Kickstarter campaign for a game called Days of Ire, which was a cooperative game on the Hungarian Revolution designed by a guy called David Tertzi. Uh, I signed up right away and I wrote in a comment on the Kickstarter site about how I had designed Operation Whirlwind 14 years ago uh, about uh, the, the Soviet operation. So within hours of me posting that comment, the designer wrote back saying, oh, that was you? And proposed that we work together on the sequel to Days of Ire uh, to cover the Soviet military response uh, to, the, to the revolution. And we called it Nights of Fire, so Days of Ire, Nights of Fire for reasons of rhyme. And we started out with a lightened and streamlined version of my original game, but during development, it steadily evolved away from a light, but still kind of numbers using war game. And it evolved into something more like a, what I would call a militarized Euro game. So some of the things that we did was, um, were we, we backed off on a detailed representation of Soviet units. So uh, instead, we just had a, a, uh, a, a, each division was shown as a set of three regiment counters. And these are the red hexagonal counters that you can see sitting on the map here. And when a regiment moves into an area, it's, you think of it as a headquarters controlling the movement of like maybe 12 or more small company sized task groups. So it would be like a rifle company reinforced with uh, some armored vehicles, artillery for direct fire, engineers to demolish and clear barricades and rubble and that sort of thing. This was how Soviet tactics worked at the time. And this is how armies generally organize themselves to fight in urban areas by delegating supporting detachments of supporting arms as low as they possibly can um, in, in the uh, table of organization and equipment. Another thing we had were garrison units, uh, which represent an assortment of infantry or MPs or other troops that occupy or control the critical points of a cleared area. So you can see again, uh, here we have the little red stars on the map. These are objectives that the Soviets uh, have to uh, occupy and garrison. And once, once they've done all of that, then, then the game is over. Um, we also worked in a concept of readiness so that uh, the Soviet troops could be distracted and less able to respond uh, to what the insurgents were doing. Meanwhile, the insurgents, as you can see, uh, there's fog of war in that they're, it's partly a block game. So the insurgents are uh, wooden blocks that are set up with one side hidden. Uh, so you don't know exactly what it is that you're engaging. Um, the insurgents are shown as a combination of locals and fighters. Locals represent larger numbers of people, but they don't move. Uh, and then you have smaller detachments of fighters that are mobile and are more able to engage uh, the Soviets, reinforce different areas. Um, and of course, in this game, we dropped the idea of American intervention very quickly. It wasn't realistic. You know, we had other mechanisms in the game to provide excitement and, you know, it really wasn't worth the extra load and the rules. One thing that's interesting about the game is it's not really an I go, you go sort of game. What the Soviet player does is he has to select uh, a number of tactics cards from a deck that he has available. Not all these cards are available to him all the time, but he has to select um, a, a hand of tactics cards at the beginning of his turn. And these are like little scripts for him to follow. Um, think of it as like a little script that a division commander might start to uh, think about and might issue as he orders his regiments around in his division, divisional sector. Um, but of course, they're not perfectly suited to all of the things that he wanted to get done. So depending on what happens, the tactics card, the cards that the uh, Soviet player picked may not be uh, at all adequate to, uh, to what's needed. Now, for the insurgents, we have an asymmetric uh, kind of relationship here. Instead, they have a hand of cards that have different numerical values and different functions on them. And what he has to do is he has to match up icons from the cards with similar icons on his units so they can carry out actions like ambushing, building barricades, and so forth. Um, so they're a little bit more flexible in what they do and how they do it. But again, they're much weaker overall uh, than the Soviet unit.
you know, than the Soviet units. And the insurgents can engage the Soviet units and disrupt them, which kind of distracts them or stops them from further activity uh, until they're rallied. And it's difficult uh, for the uh, Soviet player to do that quickly. And uh, other things that we kept uh, in the game is, of course, there is very great time pressure on the Soviets to reduce the revolutionary forces or morale to nothing and to capture everything on the map as quickly as possible. Uh, and you can see, again, that we used an area movement map, but we reduced the number of sectors uh, overall. Uh, and we do have uh, explicit divisional sectors on the map that uh, Soviet divisions cannot, cannot move out of. Now, I mentioned this was, uh, was started as a, um, from a Kickstarter game, and we did a Kickstarter for Knights of Fire as well. And because we wanted to develop the game's appeal specifically for the wider Eurogame crowd, because it was a Kickstarter, we had uh, some extras. And these included a link version with rules and cards, so the two games could be played in succession. So you play through the first game, uh, and depending on what happens in the first game, certain people, certain characters may survive, and uh, they survive the revolution, and then they get to fight in uh, the battle that comes after when the Soviets intervene. Um, we also developed a card-based solitaire version. David Turtsey is a genius, frankly, at designing simple but really effective solitaire play systems. So with no more than a dozen cards, he put together um, a solitaire version in the game that is, frankly, really brilliant and really challenging. And of course, we had toys. Uh, so part of the Kickstarter was uh, a set of miniatures as a stretch goal, and these proved to be very popular too. Um, but I think this, uh, I think this infantryman maybe looks a little bit too much like Yul Brynner, if you remember who Yul Brynner was. Anyway, I think this game as a game was an improvement on Operation Whirlwind because it had a greater ability to excite a wider range of players and to generate more dramatic narratives, uh, but it still stayed true to the historical outcome. And I thought, for me, it was very interesting to work with David, uh, who is mostly a Euro game designer, but speak, has played enough war games that he kind of speaks the dialect. And we could work together th to make this kind of hybrid game. And uh, I think that we came out of something between our differing styles and our different design approaches. I think we came out with a game that was is really quite interesting. So after that, we've already discussed a little bit, uh, Grant was asking me about the District Commander system and District Commander Maracas is the first volume to be published. This came out from Holland Spiel in 2019. Um, this was a game series or system that I started working on in 2012. I had the idea that when you have an irregular warfare situation, there are certain basic operations that are common to any and every armed forces. You have to move your people around. You have to move your stuff. You have to do something about the civilian population. You need to stay supplied. You get to get more goodies or organize yourself and pick yourself up when you get hit, that kind of thing. So the, I had the idea of so, sort of a basic set of rules, and then there were exclusive rules that were particular to each situation or volume in the series. Uh, and of course, uh, the first one that we put out uh, was uh, Maracas, which takes place in a uh, an imaginary uh, large city. Um, it, so it doesn't really exist. It was the capital, uh, the putative capital of another game that I had done on power vacuums in uh, in a Latin American country that didn't exist. It was a very thinly disguised uh, post Chavez Venezuela. So Maracas, Caracas, ha ha. So the entities in the game uh, for this series are both sides have combat units in both paramilitary and regular flavors. The unit scale is really variable. Uh, the insurgents, which are the you know, orange units, uh, are generally in small groups or platoons. And for the uh, government, which are the blue units or the green units, uh, they're companies and battalions of police and troops. You see these combat units have three different ratings on them. The top one is intelligence, which is uh, how you find or evade the enemy. Then there's troop quality, uh, which matters more than firepower. And then the bottom number is civil military operations, which is what you need to do to uh, you know, blend in with the, with the population, win people over, that kind of thing. Um, there are also assets. So with combat units or go together with assets, which are a subclass of combat unit. And these can be things like, uh, you know, things like a, a, um, uh, an EO, uh, like a, 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 a cell that's very good at making IEDs 
or a unit of suicide bombers or engineers uh, for, the, for the government player, uh, that sort of thing. So these are uh, small units that are paired up with these combat units and they uh, are able to assist in carrying out different missions. And a couple of things that we have peculiar to this particular volume, because it's taking place in a large city, are things like informer networks or command nodes for the insurgent network, you know, that kind of thing. Um, another thing that we had that uh, is basic is infrastructure units uh, in the game. These are like local political and administrative authorities. Uh, and it's very important to build and protect these in the game uh, in order to extend your control over the, uh, over the civilian population and to get your political legitimacy. Um, one other thing that this Maracas volume had was non-state actor factions. Uh, there's a terror uh, mechanic in the game which shows how normal life breaks down into a state of civil disorder and chronic if spasmodic violence. And to deal with that, two other forces arise in the game. Uh, so there's a non-state militia faction and a criminal faction. So both of these factions uh, kind of show that non-governmental forces will arise to fill the, the vacuum when the social order breaks up in a city that's racked by irregular warfare like this and law enforcement is absent. People are going to try and impose some kind of order on themselves on, and on their communities. Uh, so they'll grow into local authority figures or gang warlords. And of course, who is which depends on your point of view. So I mentioned missions. Both sides have asymmetric menus of operations that they uh, do during an interactive operations phase. There's a general division between tactical missions and non-tactical missions. An example of a tactical mission is things like patrolling, attacking, or moving from one area to another. So uh, a force of units can do this multiple times in succession. But there are also non-tactical missions like building infrastructure, recruiting and training militia, uh, intimidation campaigns, you know, that sort of thing. And these can only be done once per turn because the time scale that's required to carry this out is much different from doing an ambush or patrolling in, in, in a neighborhood. And again, action in the game, one th other thing that's interesting about the system is it doesn't use dice. Uh, you see this uh, beige looking thing up here. This is called a chance chit. And you draw a hand of these randomly at the beginning of your turn, but you can play your choice from this hand to assist you in doing different missions. And they have the three different ratings that I mentioned before, intelligence, troop, and civil military relations. And it's a little bit like being able to choose your die roll in advance, but the randomness comes both from the initial random selection at the beginning of the turn and the decisions that you make uh, during the turn because of the unequal ratings of the chits. So you might want to play a chit that's not good for one particular situation in order to save a better one with a better rating for a different situation later. And again, both sides in the game are trying to accumulate victory points uh, according to these different strategy cards. So there's four or five different strategy cards that each side has uh, that uh, relates to a certain theme. In this case, for the insurgents, it's ultraviolence. So they get lots of victory points for disrupting enemy paramilitary combat units or hitting on government or foreign uh, regular combat units. Uh, but they don't get anything for controlling the population and they don't are not penalized at all for causing any kind of terror. So again, you know, this, this shows a particular strategy or a particular posture in this case that the insurgents have chosen. Um, the other thing that happens in this game is that uh, during the game, the strategies can change on you. You can ask to change the strategy that you've been given or sometimes your higher, higher, higher is going to tell you, okay, listen, you have to, sw you have to change strategies. And even if you think it doesn't make a lot of sense, if you want to win the game, you have to do things that maybe you personally disagree with and, th and think are not effective. But again, this game puts you in the role of a mid-level commander and you're responsible to a, 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 higher, uh, it, uh, a higher authority, a higher uh, level of, of headquarters. And again, uh, here we have uh, an area movement map. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a fictional city. Um, actually, the, the basis I used for it is a map of Montevideo, not that you know it's really related to anything. Um, and time and space are really kind of indeterminate in this game. Um, there's no real equivalent for time 
uh, in the game. It could be several weeks or two more for each turn. Uh, and also you can think about it as time is passing at different rates in different parts of the map, depending on what's happening in there. As I said before, with non-tactical missions, which take a long time to carry out, uh, then you have that. And then of course you have other areas that see kinetic combat, which is much, uh, much, much more compressed in terms of time. So again, I've published four volumes in this series. Um, Maracas is the urban one. Uh, and then there are three rural ones that take place in Vietnam, uh, Algeria, and, uh, and Afghanistan. Um, I'm pleased with how this works, uh, the system works. It seems to be quite flexible, and I'm probably going to do different volumes in the future for, I don't know, Iraq, Mexico, Kashmir, you know, there's all kinds of things, just in my copious spare time. And I'd like to note, I think I mentioned this already, if you want a free print and play copy of this di uh, District Commander Maracas volume, uh, go to my website. There's a page that says free games and all of the, um, the uh, files are there for you to download and print out. Uh, you can just look at the rule book if you want to have an idea of how the system works. Uh, so you can uh, have a look at the system and try it out, you know, at no cost to you. This is, we are coming Nineveh. Um, after five o'clock, uh, which I think we're coming up on already, uh, there's going to be a presentation uh, on this game by Rex Bryman. This is an operational level game of the Iraqi government campaign to liberate the western half of Mosul from ISIS from February to July of 2017. Um, this was originally designed by two students of Rex Bryan, who's a friend of mine. Rex is a professor of political science at McGill University in Montreal. He uses games in his classes a lot. And as an experiment, a few years ago, he ran a fourth year seminar class where the students could design a game about something uh, to present their research instead of writing a paper. And uh, two of his students took him up on that. And this was their first ever essay into game design. And it was good enough right out of the gate that Rex and I saw the value in it. And we decided to help them develop it for commercial publications. And it's copies of this, the physical game, are just coming out now from Nuts Publishing in France. Um, and it is a beautiful game, as you can see. The graphic design is really good. Uh, the black blocks, uh, this is a block game. So the black blocks are ISIS. The green blocks are the Iraqi security forces, shown as battalions from the Iraqi army, Ministry of the Interior, uh, Federal Police, and you can even work in the Shia popular mobilization forces. So the game has lots of command and control issues, contr uh, coordination difficulties. Both sides have headquarters uh, that can do different things. Uh, and uh, again, you know, there's a, a very wide range of, of things that people can decide to do. Um, but again, this is a block game, so we've got a lot of uh, fog of war in it. You're never sure exactly what it is uh, that you're banging on and what and how in how good health uh, that unit happens to be or if it even exists. Um, if you look over here and you see these different scales, victory in the game has three separate measures. Uh, the, the, when the game is over, uh, the game assesses you on three key aspects of the, of the campaign. First is time, the speed at which it took the Iraqi forces to uh, complete the operation and extinguish ISIS. Second uh, metric is casualties, which are suffered by the Iraqi government forces. And the third is the amount of collateral damage that's done to the city itself. And, uh, and of course, that's a, a stand-in for civilian casualties in the city of Mosul. So you could outperform the historical case by capturing the old city faster. You know, that's the gray zone there, uh, which is kind of the uh, citadel for the ISIS forces. Uh, but you could do it at an unacceptable cost in civilian casualties and damage to the city itself. And players can assess how they did on these three aspects. You can see, again, this is an area movement game. Uh, the time scale is about two weeks per turn, uh, because of, but that's rather flexible. The, the exact equivalence is not really all that important. The intention in the game is to show the very slow and very deliberate advance by the Iraqi forces during the battle, because it took six months for for these uh, for these green you know for these green blocks. It took six months for them to go from here to there. Uh, and to finally extinguish ISIS in the citadel itself, because ISIS had had two full years to fortify the city, and it was just an absolute maze of IEDs, uh, 
bombs, uh, you know, uh, foxholes, tunnels, um, alleys, all kinds of things that were extremely dangerous and very hard to, to advance through quickly. Also, the game has two decks of cards. One is capabilities, uh, which you select from at the beginning of the game, and they give you uh, s some uh, different powers and give you different abilities, and they represent uh, things that the designers identified in the research and allows you to do a little bit of pre-game planning and investment in capabilities of how you want to go about taking the city. So an example here, this is a, a coalition capability game uh, for air support. And this gives you, uh, it costs you five points, um, and which is, you know, middle and big. Uh, and then these are the conditions that you can use it under, and then these are the effects it has. And down here, this is an example of how the different cards look for the different, uh, the different uh, sides. And uh, the numbers on them are two hit numbers. So you roll a bucket full of dice, and you try to beat uh, the numbers that uh, are on. And you can see as a unit takes uh, takes casualties, uh, the block is rotated and it becomes harder and harder for the, uh, the, the block to hit anything. There's also a deck of event cards at uh, continually during the game, when things happen, uh, you end up drawing these event cards and these can create collateral damage. You know, again, you try to avoid that in the game, but it's unavoidable. And then other uh, events can give you little tactical vignettes and you have to uh, decide whether or not you're gonna play through this little vignette. Uh, so the local guide here is an example for one of these things. So as I mentioned, this was published by Nuts Publishing, which is a French company. And uh, physical copies are just now making their way into people's hands. Okay, now Grant was talking before about how I came to uh, come into contact with the 40th Infantry Division and uh, General Wooldridge and how the games came about that I developed for the use of, uh, of the 40th Infantry Division for this Urban Operation Planners course. So I was talking before about the first serial of the Urban Operation Planners course and uh, the game, uh, the one-off game that was put together by Colonel Gygax. And this is a picture of the game as it was being played. Uh, I think the tall man in the back with the dark hair is Colonel Gygax. I never met him. Uh, he's, as I said, he retired from the guard now, but I think he's the one who put it all together. And you can see that it's, uh, you have the students in the class are grouped around a, a large map. In this case, this happens to be a map of downtown Manila. Uh, and their units are actually little pieces of index card and post-it notes that are moving around on, um, on, on the map. And uh, the narrative that they're engaging in is, comes out of the different moves and decisions that they make. So in this game, uh, there were different factions. There were U.S. forces, allied forces, civilians, uh, the enemy, and a criminal unit, uh, a criminal faction. So. All of these factions were kind of sparring with each other within the city, uh, trying to defend or attack, uh, you know, what they what they held dear. So again, um, after this first iteration of the course, General Wooldridge contacted me and he wanted a game that would reinforce the main points and considerations of the material that was being studied and taught in the course. Uh, and at the same time, the game had to be simple enough for players to pick up quickly, but not be too simplistic, nor be incomplete. And finally, the game should be available for course members to use and adapt for themselves if they want it, without the need for an experienced director or a directing staff. So we talked about it, and he asked me if I wanted to do this, and I said, of course I'd be interested to do this, sir. And I spent the next six months putting together two different games for him. Uh, the first that I put together was um, the uh, the the, uh, the, um, the scalable urban simulation, and you know even though other games of mine had often been used in professional military education settings, this was the first time in my thirty year design career that I had been asked to develop a game from the ground up for professional military use. So I spent a lot of time on it. I tested it very carefully, and I spent a lot of time consulting as much as possible. Um, with, uh, with the staff uh, for guidance on how this game would fit in with points of doctrine, uh, our army doctrine that was being worked out uh, for urban operations, uh, how to use the correct vocabulary, you know, all those kinds of things. 
Um, so it was a, a fair amount of work. And as I said, I ended up doing two, two and a half games uh, on the topic. Um, but I think it, it was worth it. So what the first thing that came out was the scalable urban simulation. Uh, it expanded on an idea that I've been working on and had held in my head for some time about producing a set of standard rules that would, you know, that would work for some basic mechanisms and options at uh, a battalion, brigade, or division size games. Uh, and then there, there would in turn be um, uh, exclusive rules that uh, matched up with the particular basic mechanics or menus of operations. So the entities in the game would be combat formations or support formations that either command maneuver units or allocated enablers. An example of an enabler is, uh, you know, like an armor detachment or a sustainment battalion, a UAV unit or that kind of thing. Uh, the, the enablers uh, in the game, they generate resource cubes uh, and the resource cubes, which represent, again, uh, not always physical goods. Sometimes they represent things like ammunition or fuel or vehicles or reinforcements. Sometimes they represent efforts uh, spent in intelligence uh, or time spent planning, you know, that sort of thing. And then these resources are funneled through the headquarters units and uh, under the direction of the headquarters units, they reach the maneuver units. And the maneuver units are the ones that are placed on the map and go through uh, trying to carry out certain operations. And there's different classes of operations uh, and the different uh, colors of resources, uh, which correspond to different uh, cells of, of, or streams of effort in a command post, uh, will, they're, they're of, of use for, di for different operations. And um, how this works is through headquarters units try to carry out operations um, but their ability to do this keeps declining uh, as, as the units get more and more beaten up, tired out, your resources run out. Um, so this, uh, and, and of course, the, uh, again, this is a form of area movement map. This is not a very good shot, uh, but the idea with this map is that it's actually built up out of little square tiles uh, that are about four or five inches square. Uh, with several locations within each one that are rated for uh, like defensibility uh, and uh, paths and different infrastructure features and this sort of thing. And what you can do in this game is that you can do a free form arrangement of these uh, isomorphic square tiles so you can build a city as you like. So you can uh, put together like a dense downtown core uh, with uh, suburban areas or a dispersed city with, you know, heavy and lightly constructed neighborhoods, you know, that sort of thing, um, which was, I thought, was, again, uh, 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 an idea that I wanted to, to work out. Anyway, um, after I got this game to work, it was became obvious to me that this playing through this game, even though I was satisfied with it, would be asking a lot of the students to... Uh, you know, to pick up on and to play and to learn something all in one day. So I realized right away we need something that was a lot less process heavy. And so um, I, I, I designed a game called the Quick or Quick Urban Integrated Combat Kriegspiel uh, that used um, the major themes and many of the, the functions of the scalable urban simulation but it was much more simplified and streamlined. And I went to uh, a, an abstract war game uh, called War Chest that came out about five years ago. Uh, it was designed by David Thompson and it's very popular uh, among you know, uh, people who are getting started in war games. It has kind of a medieval theme uh, with knights and bowmen and things like that. So, and additional combat power comes from picking units out of a bag and stacking them up. But the idea I had uh, was to uh, have it work, uh, still retain some role uh, for headquarters and planning or decision making because after all the students on this course are meant to be staff officers or NCOs on the staffs of brigades and divisions. So trying to have them think about what a headquarters would be thinking about in trying to prosecute uh, you know, uh, combat operations in a large urban area. And so again, not a really detailed model of urban combat, but you know, focusing a little bit more on uh, deciding what to do and how to do it and why to do it. 
Um, and again, to point out to the students the very nature and the resources, the uses of the resources and the enablers that are available to them within a large unit like a brigade combat team or a division. Uh, the different domains and the functions that they contribute to and how they can be combined and used to execute operations successfully. Um, General Wooldridge uh, was the one who suggested the title Quick Urban Integrated Combat Creeksfield. Uh, so it has a recursive acronym of QUIC. Uh, the general in his day job is a software engineer, so I think he liked the idea that it was recursive. And whatever the general suggests, the general gets. And in any event, it was better than my working title for the game, which was Sucking Chest Wound. Uh, don't ask me where that came from. Um, anyway, his, his is better. And again, I was more than fortunate in that General Wooldridge, who is a gamer himself uh, and others on his staff, including the senior training advisor for the division, were also war gamers. And they took the time as they were able to help me shape and develop the game, as well as advising me on how to make specific points and mechanics in the game relate back explicitly to points of American uh, military doctrine on urban operations. Um, I also had some good support because some staff at uh, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, cooked up a vassal module uh, very quickly uh, for the remote students uh, because there were about 40 students attended the course in person. There were about another 40 students who attended remotely from around the world. And uh, very quickly, they put together a vassal module that people could download and play for themselves. So... The entities in the game, uh, the roles, uh, the players are in the role of division or group army commanders. Uh, so it's either the fictional U.S. 52nd Infantry Division or the Alvanan 17th Group Army, which is currently stationed in Guangzhou. Um, there are also green forces uh, from Belizea, which is a fictional country. Uh, Olvana is the fictional country that the American military uses in something called a decisive action training environment, uh, because you can't come right out and say, oh, we're training to fight Russia or we're training to fight uh, uh, China, you know, these sorts of things. So they have these um, fictional countries with worked out uh you know, militaries and force structures and governments and so forth that are very much like certain real world counterparts, but you can't quite call it that. So again, it's the U.S. versus the Olvanans. <clears throat> um, each force in the game is divided into uh, brigades uh, or brigade combat teams, each with a, a headquarters and some assigned maneuver units, which are combat arms battalions. Uh, so you can see them here. There's a divisional headquarters, and then uh, you have different uh, battalions of different grades uh, or equipment. Um, and then, of course, you have these enablers. And these represent um, smaller uh, assets, which are, again, the supporting arms. So here we have a selection of uh, engineers, electronic warfare, uh, combat aviation, rocket artillery, uh, sustainment, that sort of thing. So. Um, what these do is these allow the players to do a kind of task organization at battalion, brigade, or division level of where and how they assign these enablers, and they have different powers and different abilities depending on whether they're attached directly to a battalion or to a brigade headquarters or to a division headquarters. Um, the game has a sequence of play where one round is divided into uh, planning, preparation, and execution. During the course of a round, players will select cubes um, that represent their general intentions during the round, and they discard them one by one in an interactive uh, 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 operations phase, where they go through the basic activities of moving, attacking, organizing, and recovering. Uh, enablers also have associated colors of cube, and expending these allow you to um, exercise their special powers and abilities, and as I said, they change according to where the enabler is in, in the organization. Um, so the game's time scale and space scale is not exact. Uh, you know, we used a regular grid to represent the city, uh, but uh, students were reminded during the game that the game centers on control of the critical terrain in a city, uh, which is not evenly distributed uh, through a city. Uh, it's not spaced out evenly, so a hex on this map effectively can be anywhere from a few hundred meters to a kilometer or two wide, uh, which reflects the great changes in density or navigability within a city 
uh, and how much of it a maneuver unit can traverse or control. It's only the proximities or the adjacencies that, that really matter in the game. Um, we had a little bit of differentiation of terrain. So we have some areas that are lighter in construction. Those are the orange hexes. And then the blue ones are close uh, or more densely populated uh, and, and, uh, and more heavily structured. So um, as I said, we had 40 physical students and uh, some of them already knew something about board war games and they took to it right away. For others, it was something completely new. Uh, but I think everybody learned something out of this. Uh, I didn't get any real complaints uh, at the time uh, or, or since. Uh, and uh, obviously it helps when you have a sponsor in the form of, of a brigadier general <laughs> who's backing you up on this uh, and instigating the whole thing. Uh, the students, of course, were open to this. Uh, the, the game was played on the last day of the course. Uh, this was after five or six days of a lot of lectures and classroom stuff. So people were getting a little bit tired, uh, wanting to get home. Uh, but this was a good activity to have them do, I think, on the last day of the course, because what we were trying to do here was trying to tie together the different lessons uh, and material that, and points that we've been trying to put across during the previous week uh, about things like, you know, the difficulties uh, and the intensity of, of operations in in, uh, in in city, how to deal with civilians and how to deal with infrastructure, that kind of thing. I was also very fortunate in that I had uh, a good number of facilitators uh, to help me uh, 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 to teach the game and to help people when they ran into uh, into, into difficulties. Uh, and of course, I mentioned already that uh, the uh, people at CGSC put together a vassal module, uh, which was uh, of value for the remote students. And uh, again, we often forget that what is familiar to us with these games, you know, this is not a it's not a, a hugely detailed or complex game uh, by our standards in the hobby. Uh, but, you know, this was something that I think was very, very uh, new to these uh, to these particular students. So that went well. Uh, but after the course, later in the year, I got to talking with one of the students from the course. He was a first lieutenant from the German Army's Airborne Brigade. Very smart man. Um, and the Leutnant, Fallschirmige Leutnant, remarked that all of the scenarios that we had in the quick game, they all took place within the city itself. Uh, so both sides set up in the city. Uh, there was nothing about the approach to the city or the battle or the operations to try and isolate the city, to uh, try and outmaneuver the opponent outside the city, or to bite into the city to get kind of a foothold before the climactic urban battle. And he pointed out that division and brigade staff officers and planners, and again, this was the audience for the course, needed to think about the battle before the urban battle to try and set up favorable conditions for the fight within the city. Because once you're into the city itself, the battle becomes more of a company, platoon, even a section commander's battle. Um, and what these unit commanders need is to, in order to get a good start on things, is they need the planners to have done a good job of logistics and maneuvering and coordinating with the support arms organizations in order to support them when they're fighting forward in the city. So to try and work that through, I designed a game I called Exurb. Uh, I've, I've just put this together in the last couple of months. It's a very short, simple game for two players that abstracts some of the processes and actions that a large military unit, which again is assumed to be a division or an Ovan and group army, uh, or it could be even a corps, the considerations that they would encounter when preparing to attack or defend a large urban area. And uh, this is uh, our ATP, Army Technical Publication 306 Urban Operations, talks about five or six different uh, states uh, or phases for an urban operation. First of all, you think about the end state. What do you want uh, out of the game? But first, you, have a, you approach the city and you consolidate and organize your rear area which is how, how you set out your logistics and your fire support. You try to isolate either the entire city, if it's possible, or a section of the city, bite into the city to gain a foothold, and then you try to destroy the enemy in the parts of the city where it counts, where to clear area to control the objective. And ultimately, you try to uh, clear the city and return control of it to the civilian organization or to military government. So this exurb game uh, is the battle before the battle, and it deals with phases one through four. 
Um, it uses two decks of ordinary playing cards. I think ordinary playing cards are a really interesting way to put a point across in a game in a very simple way using something that people are already very popular you know that, that's it's it's popular and already well known everybody plays cards everybody knows how a deck of cards is built and i think people maybe don't have that much of a problem uh trying to map uh for example suits of cards in a deck of ordinary playing cards to different uh functions and in this case, uh, we have the different suits in, uh, in the game, and we map them to different war fighting functions. So uh, spades are fire, clubs are intelligence, hearts is maneuver, and diamonds is sustainment. And what we do is uh, we have these particular efforts, and cards are played according to their suit. But how many cards you can play at a time and what they do depends on your enablers, which you group at echelons above brigade or at brigade level. And uh, I can't really zoom in on this uh, here uh, to get a good, good shot, but each of these enablers represent uh, a group from uh, different supporting arms. So it could be like a sustainment battalion, uh, a tank company, uh, a UAV, like a, a drone unit, you know, that sort of thing, special forces, that kind of deal. And they have special powers or special um, proclivities. Uh, so for example, a special forces uh, detachment is good at intelligence. You know, they're good at scoping things out and strategic reconnaissance, that sort of thing. And uh, a, a tank unit, uh, you can attach tanks to a unit and they're good at producing fire and they're good at maneuver. So it's that sort of thing. Um, so again, the game is played out in four different phases. Uh, both players, they play cards. Uh, and uh, at the end of each phase, when people have played out their cards, you score. And within each phase, both sides expend resources and effort, which are symbolized by the cards they play. There's a restricted amount of cards that you can draw from and uh, ones that you can expend from your reserve. Uh, each phase is scored as you go. And depending on the phase, certain war fighting functions are more important and the scores for those are doubled. And there's consequences to the winner or loser after each round. So say for example, in phase one here, when you're uh, looking to um, approach the city and consolidate your rear. Uh, it's important to get as much intelligence about the enemy as possible. And sustainment is important because you're trying to set up your logistical area in, in, you know, in, in the rear of your unit. Um, okay, and, okay, where am I? there we go. Okay, so uh, there we are. So this has been a brief introduction uh, of me just talking about eight games that I've designed uh, or help to design on modern urban combat. Some of them are historical and others are generic or have imaginary settings, but in all cases, to me, they've illuminated different aspects of urban warfare that I thought were important to uh, either regular or irregular warfare. And um, I think I've kind of just tried to describe how after each game, I've kind of learned more and more and come to organize my thinking a little bit more about uh, urban conflict in both uh, urban, uh, in, in both regular and irregular flavors. So uh, there's my email and there's, again, is the URL of my WordPress blog. Uh, you go there and uh, if you're interested in the full script uh, or the slides uh, of, that I've been working my way through, uh, just go to the WordPress and uh, scroll back uh, to the entry about SD Histcon, and you can download the slides uh, for this particular um, uh, for this particular presentation. And of course, there's a page where you can get uh, free games. And now I need to stop sharing the screen, and I forget how to do that. That's okay. Yeah. Help! We're, we're all back. Is that anybody was still here? There, there are a few story? people. If you know, the, um, I have a few questions about what we just heard, but. Uh, if anybody else does, please just uh, just type them in the comments, and uh, I'll pass them along. Okay, um, I'm glad it's not just you and I. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's a few people left. I was All looking right. at that that first one you talked about the the Tupamara, um, mm -hmm. I, I, the map, the non um, the the map that was more like sectors of society or interests. Uh, I really really reminded me of what. Um, 
Fred Serval did with uh, his Red Flags over Paris game has got a sort of a similar feel. I wonder, it made me immediately think if, I wondered if he'd ever seen your Tupamara game. Uh, I don't think so. I've talked to Fred a couple times, but we never talked about that. Um, when I learned that Fred was was uh, doing a game on the Paris Commune, I thought, great, because I'd always wanted to do a Paris Commune game myself, uh, but I'd never gotten around to doing it. I wrote a big, long article on the Paris Commune for Strategy and Tactics magazine years and years ago, uh, and so I'd always been interested in it, and I'd done the research, just never had the time to do a game. And when I heard that Fred was doing it, I wrote to him, and you know, we, we, had, we batted it back a little bit, uh, back and forth, and I sent him my article and stuff. Um, but no, we never actually talked about Tupamaro itself and how that might have affected it. Um, but Fred is a very smart guy. He's a really brilliant designer, I think. And he could see that the battle for the Paris Commune was partly physical. And, you know, you have that part that's played out on the game, but it's also an ideological or a political battle. So he could see the very clear division between the two and the division of effort between those two spheres. And uh, I think Red Flag over Paris is just a brilliant game. Now, the mechanics and structure of that game is actually drawn from Fort Sumter yeah, by yeah. Mark Herman. Uh, yeah. you know, and that's a, a really intelligent application uh, of, of the thinking there. So I think Fred, of, of course, was obviously much more um, informed you know, by, Fort, by the mechanics of Fort Sumter than... Yeah, than it, was just a, it was just... Same a, idea, you know. The map of... Uh... The map not representing a physical space, but a, an influence space. Uh, that was the the similarity I saw between your game and his game for sure. I, yep. I was I was also I was interested in uh, the two games on Hungary that you did, and what a crazy challenge to set for yourself to try and make a, <laughs> like this is like Godzilla's foot coming down on Tokyo. And you've got a, and one player gets to be the foot, and the other player has to be Tokyo. I mean, like, what a crazy place to start from to try and find your way to make a game out of that particular situation. Yeah, there are a few war games out there that are on really desperate last stand kind of situations, you know, like Thermopylae, uh, you know, or, or um, well, I can't give any others right yeah. now that are just real, like forlorn hope kind of games. And yeah, Budapest 1956 is one of those. That's the grand gesture of defiance, you know. And, um, you know, my first game, the Operation Whirlwind is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it kind of touches on those sorts of things, but it's like, a, it's kind of the procedure heavy war game. But working with David uh, Tertzi on, on Knights of Fire, uh, he has uh, a better sense than I do of what makes a good narrative, a good story. So we incorporated things into Knights of Fire, like civilian counters. Uh, so there, there are these civilian counters on the map uh, that have to be rescued and, and convoyed out of the city uh, by the insurgents. So the first thing they have to do, one of the first things they have to do when the game starts is to evacuate the, these civilian counters. Um, because if the Soviet player uh, manages to close in on them and arrest them, then he gets victory points. So this is how he denies victory points. And the civilians in this case represent dissidents, uh, like people in the, the Hungarian revolutionary government, you know, people who are politically dangerous, uh, but need to evacuate. So by and large, they're not ordinary people, but they're right. people who are, you know, critical and need to be. To be. Now, this wasn't quite true to history because everything happened so fast a right, um, hundred hours and, and, yeah a hundred hours uh, but 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 the 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 the, the um the, the the hungarian civilian exodus you know both from budapest and from hungary itself streams and streams of these people leaving um and going into austria you know across the border uh and the the hungarian army you know just standing aside and just letting people flood you know into austria and escape you know uh, into freedom uh was was uh, interesting um at the time in 1956 uh nixon richard nixon was vice president of the united states and he made it a special mission to go to austria and to uh, try and organize uh, relief for the civilians who are streaming into Austria through the American embassy. So I, I, I ran across a picture of, of, um, of, of uh, Richard Nixon with his hands full of raw hamburger 
<laughs> making, he gets, he's helping the wife of the American ambassador to Austria. He's helping her to make, uh, like cook up soup, you know, cause they set up these soup kitchens, you know, to give these people a hot, the refugees, a hot meal and to help them, you know, process them and get them through to the United States. Cause the United States and Canada, uh, for two, and I think other countries in Europe benefited tremendously from, you know, from the tragedy of the Hungarian revolution, because so many talented people, scientists, engineers, all these kind of people, they fled, uh, you know, the Soviet Union or, or the, yeah, I, uh, the influence Hungarian of the Soviet Union. Uh, was a part of the diaspora. He came here yeah. in 56 and yeah, with, and with his wife and he was a great guy. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a funny little bit of, of popular culture there. You know, Nixon smiling with a big double handful of, of, of hamburger working a meat grinder. While he's making... Smiling is an interesting photo in itself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another thing that struck me in your talk was when you were talking about your district commander um, um, games, uh, those, uh, the the three values on the units, the, you know, it's we're so used to like attack, defense or range and movement, but you've got three completely different values on these counters. Like you, you've, you've taken the idea of a counter and turned it on its head a little bit here. Yep. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, it's really, it's, th those three ratings, they stand in for a lot of things like the intelligence rating is one that both sides use for finding the enemy, well, finding the insurgent or evading the government. Uh, and it's, that's a reflection of how well-trained uh, or how experienced your troops are at finding or escaping from you know, the enemy. Uh, the troop rating, which stands in when you use combat, uh, is not just firepower, but it's also, again, um, a measure of unit cohesion and how well they coordinate, how well they work, you know, together in, in, in fighting. And civil military, that's what you need when you need to recruit militia uh, or build infrastructure or that sort of thing. And you've got to build and protect the infrastructure within the city uh, because that's how you exert and keep control over the civilian population and how you uh, control the lines of communication or transit, you know, around the city or the countryside or, you know, it's a standard goal for the series. Um, so yeah, it, there's those three ratings. And then of course, the, the idea of getting rid of dice and, uh, and, and just, uh, allowing these chits, you know, yeah. with all their different ratings, they're all mixed up and you've got, uh, a, a random handful that you draw at the beginning of the turn, but it's up to you, uh, how you want to expend them, you know, during, uh, during the game. And the combat system is interesting too, because, uh, the amount uh, like who wins the battle is not related to the amount of damage or casualties that are that uh, that are suffered by both sides. So you can lose a battle, uh, but come off really you know lightly in terms of casualties, or you can win but get your nose really bloodied. Um, and it's it's uh, it's it's it, it, there's a there's a semi-random kind of mechanic going on there. Uh, so you can play something with a different rating that you can think would really bloody the guy's nose, even though you think that you're probably going to lose the battle. You're going to go down swinging. Some people, it, it's a little hard for some people, uh, you know, to get their heads around that when they play this kind of game. Because this game, this district commander system, it does things very differently uh, in several fundamental aspects of the game are very different from standard war games. Uh, and you know, that's not to everybody's taste for sure, but I like it. Oh, well, what I'm interested, I have a couple of questions about it. Um, I, I, I'm totally struck by it. I'm wondering, um, given that the Maracas one is the, the big urban one and then the other three are, are, uh, more rural, is there a big difference between the way the urban game plays compared to the other three in the series? Um, there are certain things in the game that are not there in other modules of the game. Like I mentioned, um, the, the non-state militia, you know, which are like vigilantes in some case, uh, or armed gangs or private security companies, mercenaries, that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the organized crime, you know, criminal faction. So those are not present those two factions are not present in in the other modules um 
well, actually, we did we did have that in Afghanistan because it's it's such a chaotic situation, broken down. But it's not in the other two modules. But that's the kind of thing that would be erupting in a city where you have a huge number of of uh, of, of civilians, you know, very densely, you know, within each, um, you know, uh, concentrated within each other. And of course, the ground scale, <clears throat> excuse me, of the map is much smaller. Uh, you know, where each uh, area is maybe a mile or two, you know, and of course, it, you know, out in the other areas, you know, the areas are much, much larger right. and they're rated for different, um, uh, like the, the the terrain is more complex. You know, it, it's much harder to find and locate the enemy. Uh, and uh, there's a, a greater, um, a greater ability for ambushes, you know, that kind of thing. I would imagine most folks that are uh, that are watching this either at live or uh, or uh, in the in the future <laughs> when it's posted on YouTube are probably going to be most interested in the uh, the Maracas one just because we're talking about urban con uh, combat today. But uh, thinking of the series of, of a whole, it, it, which it, is there any one of the four that you say like this is the best introduction to this system if you wanted to. Uh, dip your toe in the water or uh, <laughs> they're all pretty easy? Yeah, um, that's a lot like the question that many people ask, which coin system game should I start with? You know, like I'm interested in the system, but you know, which one should I start with? Uh, I My answer to that question is generally go with one that interests you most historically or thematically. Uh, if you're into Vietnam, War games, you already have an, an introduction, some idea of what's going on in the Vietnam War, then pick up the Bin Din one. Uh, if you're interested in Afghanistan, you know, Kandahar. Uh, and if you're interested in urban combat, you know, then, then this one. Maracas is, um, it's a little, well, I'd say Maracas and Kandahar are probably a bit more complicated than the others because they have those two extra factions right. of non-state militia and criminals. Uh, who pop up on the map, the more violent things are, the more bashed up things get, uh, the more you have these guys showing up. And that's something else that you have to deal with. I mean, that's a bit of a complication. And there are some other things that are just in the Maracas game uh, that aren't in others, like uh, government informers and command nodes and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a little bit of extra things. It's just, uh, but... Uh, but again, they've got a, the same basic structure, uh, the same basic set of rules. Uh, and once you can swallow those, because as I said, it's, it, it can be a, quite a bit different from the standard run of Hex Encounter War games. Um, I like different. So Maraca yeah. sounds like one I'll probably start with anyway, because I like well, the idea of the, uh, the broken down society and how yeah. the more society breaks down, the more control becomes incredibly local instead of... Yeah, from higher up. You... There's there's also an aspect of psychological warfare in that game in the Maracas because there are certain there are a couple points. What are what did I call them? Objective points in the game, and uh, the insurgent can attack them. You know, he's not attacking enemy forces, uh, but he's kind of attacking it in the sense of generating some kind of spectacular event, you know, like a bombing or a big bank robbery or a huge popular demonstration at a particular area. And it will have some kind of outside, uh, outsize, um, you know, psychological effect. Uh, you know, again, it depends on the particular strategy that the insurgent is doing at the time. So the right. example card I showed was ultraviolence, where you're just going out to gun down as many government soldiers you know, as, as you can, and, you know, you can create as much terror and use as much violence as you want, and you're not going to be penalized for it. But then there are others where you're trying to go for more of a psychological dominance. Right, and right. there is where you're, you know, uh, hurting the enemy physically is really deprecated, but you bag more points for taking out infrastructure, like government, you know, administrative structures and, and doing spectaculars. I saw in the game how um, you can get orders from top come from top down where you have to change your strategy. But your initial strategy, do you get to choose that or do you draw it randomly or how, how you can does go either your... way? It okay. depends how difficult you make you want how difficult you want your life to be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, and and also during the game, you do have a chance every so often during the game to ask to change your strategy. Oh, right. You know, which is but again, your strategy is just the scheme that you get victory points for. 
Yeah. But, yeah. So you can play the game however you want. You, you know, yeah. if, it, it doesn't matter if they're if they're telling you to be nice. You can be as violent as you want. It's just it's you know, not going to score. It's not going to help you. <laughs> or well, it maybe it helps you. It depends on what you think is important to be doing in the game at that point. But your higher ups, of course, you know, for other reasons, political reasons or whichever, may be thinking, you know, you need to be doing it this way. Well, we should probably wrap up. And uh, if if anybody has any last minute questions, type them in quickly. But uh, we've uh, we've gone almost an over an hour over time anyway. So sorry. Uh, no, that's all good. This is uh, this is going to make for a, a great uh, YouTube posting, so that anybody who didn't make it will be able to see it uh, it uh, from tomorrow on. I think so. Thanks. I'm really glad we were able to do that. Me, this is this is great. It's uh, good for good for your friends uh, across the pond, and and good for uh, good for people uh, that uh, you know are are working or whatever. You know, like some people could come this morning, couldn't come tonight. Um, it's just the way it goes. But the fact that we can have this live on uh, is fantastic, and and I'm so thankful to uh, to Harold and the whole gang with uh, uh, San Diego Histcon for uh, inviting us both to to come and do this. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for sticking with us, Fred. <laughs> yes, yes, thanks, Fred. <laughs> I don't I, I didn't show you this one earlier. This is this will make you um this will make you happy probably. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Fred, and, and thanks for everybody else who uh who stuck with us. Uh uh thanks, Brian. Um I'll wrap it up now and uh I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the convention. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Bye-bye.